with me this morning. Father God, as we come to you this morning, we are so thankful to meet together and to worship you. God, no matter what has gone on this week in our lives, God, it is, it is well. We lay it at your feet. We turn to you as our Father in heaven who we know, is, we know loves us, who cares for us, is there for us. God, you've seen everything we've gone through this week, everything we've experienced. You know our emotions. You know our physical health. You know our emotional health. You, you know everything that's going on. And so, God, we just come to you and just ask for a wise word from you. God, would you speak to us? Would you change us from the inside out? Would your spirit be, be present here? And would, it, would we be changed, Lord? We thank you so much for everything that you've done and everything you're about to do, Lord. In your name we pray. Well, hey, I am so glad that you are here. Why don't you turn to somebody next to you and say, hey, it's so awesome to see you today. And if you're watching online, tell us where it is you're watching from. We're so glad that you're here. We, uh, we are excited that you guys are here, and uh, we hope that, you know, you guys feel at home today, that you have a great experience. That's what's really important to us. And, uh, you know, our whole vision is to be a church for people who don't like church. So we hope that this doesn't feel too churchy here today. We hope it feels like it's a little different and a little special. I tend to think that the people are the, the thing that makes it so special. And so we hope that you uh, get to know some people and make some friends here because that's what we're all, we'll all need in life at different, different points in times. And so um, we're glad you're here. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids. All our kids through fifth grade are going to get to go downstairs in their uh, mainly dry classrooms. And... Uh, they're going to go and, and have a lesson and, and have some fun down there. And uh, our kids had a, a fun time. Uh, many of them were asking last night, do we get to do this again tomorrow? And we said, yeah, except for the only difference is, is Kona Ice isn't going to be there. So, uh, but we had a really, really good time. Uh, before we begin our message today, I want you guys to, to watch this video. Give me your tired your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Some came to this land on the Mayflower. Some came to discover their lives. Some came to save them. But no matter how they arrived, one thing is certain. The same invitation they received echoes in our hearts today. They invite us into a life that's worth living, no matter what our past. They encourage us to walk the path God's given us, no matter what turns confront us. It's beautiful, really, because we are the tired. We are the poor. We are the huddled masses who yearn to breathe free. And the oxygen we breathe is given to us by God through brave men and women who have died for us. We inhale freedom. We exhale gratitude. And so today, we remember. Today, we honor. Today, we pause. We pay attention. We acknowledge our indebtedness. And we rejoice in our freedom. This is a day of remembrance. This is Memorial Day. This is America. Okay, it's not Memorial Day, but you get the point. Um, <laughs> Here's what I, here's here's what we want to do. And, you know, this is this is a uh, this is like our, our our patriotic themed message. And I want you guys to do something for me. I want to see how American you really actually are. Okay. And so all of you, you love America, right? You love the country that you, you live in. And so you all should be very very educated in, in our in our Constitution. Correct. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take 90 seconds, and I want to see if you can name the first 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights, okay? You can use a partner, so go ahead, turn to somebody next to you, all right? Turn to somebody next to you real quick. 
If you're watching online, I want to see if you can write it in the comment section, all right? The first 10 amendments, go. It's a lot of confused looks. Come on. There's a lot of heads shaking right now. You've got about 45 seconds. No, just keep them to yourselves or write them down or, you know, just see how many you can name. So the first 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights. Okay, you got about 20 seconds. Some of you are like, D I'm eating a donut. I'm sorry. I can't talk right now. I'm... Okay, ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, raise your hand if you could name all 10 first amendments of the Bill of Rights. Wow. First 10 amendments, yeah, 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights. No, nothing? Okay. All right. Well, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what they are, okay? So if you didn't know, today you're going to become edumacated by Michael Davis on the Bill of Rights, all right? Yeah, welcome to my class. Everybody grab your pens and papers, okay? All right, so let's go over these, right? So freedom of speech, right? A lot of you guys know what, 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 about that one. That one gets talked about a lot, right? So freedom of speech, the right to, uh, to bear arms. And we're not, we're not talking about pastor's bear arms. We're talking about the other kind of bear arms, right? The bear arms that some of you have, right? But the right to bear arms, right, and defend yourself. The quartering of soldiers. Does anybody know what the quartering of soldiers is? Some of you do. Some of you are in military, right? It means the military can't come in and take over your house and make it into like a, a, a you know, a holding station. You know, they're not going to like be, take over your home. They can't do that. So you don't have to quarter soldiers. Search and seizure. Uh, due process. Right to a, a, a fair trial. Uh, freedom of religion, which, woo hoo uh, uh, Cruel and unusual punishment. Some of you married into this, but you have a right to not have to go through that. And uh, powers reserved to the states, which means that there are certain rights that are reserved to the states. Now, if you can count, there are only nine here, right? Does anybody know what the Ninth Amendment is? Does anybody know? None of you do. Okay, well, it's going to be on the screen, all right? Very, by the way, July 4th, y'all really need to, like, read your kid a book or something, okay? Uh, but the Ninth Amendment says this. It says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And you all know what that means, right? Yeah, you don't. Okay, well, here we go. This is the Michael Davis translation of it, all right? This is what it would really say. I have the right to do what I want, when I want, with whom I want, as long as it doesn't interfere with anyone else's amended Ninth Amendment rights. Does that make a little bit more sense? Here's what was happening. This was James Madison's attempt for people to understand that the rights that are listed here are not people's only rights. Just because it's not listed here doesn't mean it's your only right that you have. There are other certain rights that you have freedoms to, but the thing is, is they can't conflict with other people's rights. So let, let's just use, for example, the, the right to privacy, right? Does anybody think that they have the right to privacy? I, I, you better raise your hands or I'm going to start coming over a little bit more, okay? You think, you think you have the right to privacy. Well, guess what? The right to privacy doesn't actually show up in your constitution at all. Although in the 1920s, the, uh, co the, the Congress decided that this fit within the Ninth Amendment right. And the Supreme Court made a ruling that people do have the right to privacy. Yes, you have the right to know who your neighbors are and to know things about them. But you're, there's a certain point where you infringe on other people's rights and people have a right to privacy. And then guess what? If you commit a crime or there's a certain offense or a certain line that you cross, you lose your right to privacy because other people have a right to know that you're a creeper. And so they make you go tell people. And so, but you do have the right to privacy. Or how about in 1965? In 1965, there was a, a, a court hearing of Griswold versus Connecticut. Does anybody know what this one was about? This one was about two doctors who opened a birth control center and began to distribute this drug that we call today the pill, birth control, right? And guess what? The state actually arrested them and said, you can't do that. You can't start handing out this pill, this contraceptive for people to take. And Griswold and their, their lawyers said, no, wait a minute. 
people, if people have the right to, 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 to prevent a birth from occurring, if, there's a, if, if birth control is, is, is legal, well then, you know what, then they have the right to choose whatever type of contraceptive that, that they want to use. And so Griswold actually won this, and this is how we're able to have the pill today. But actually, when the pill first came out in this form of contraceptive, it was actually illegal, and there was this huge dispute. But this court case, they decided, no, people have the right to choose. And thank goodness, man, because we would just be having so many little kids running around here. But, you know, but we, we know that we have certain rights. There are certain rights we have that are not listed in the Constitution. But here's what everybody knows about rights, right? Rights have to be coupled with responsibility, right? Freedom and rights have to be coupled with responsibility. Do you remember when you were 16 and they told you that you had the right to get a driver's license, right? And you got that driver's license and you got behind that car and you were like, hey, wait a minute. That speedometer says it goes up to 120. Wow, I didn't know that. That this this thing can go as fast as I want it to, and oh man, did you did you know that you know you could you that that line that's on the road you can cross that line, you can go off road. Did you know if you've got a big enough vehicle you can go all kinds of places and you can do all kinds of things, right? And then when you got in that car, you were like, hey, wait a minute, my mom and dad won't let my girlfriend come to my room, but this is like a portable room. I mean. <laughs> I mean, I could take this anywhere oh, in any park. Kate, you remember this when we were dating? We could take it anywhere we want. <laughs> is she in service today or is she with the kids? Hey, honey, what's up? Um, shoot. Uh, but, but you're like, you know, I could do all kinds of things, right? And you have a right to do that. But what happened, right? Your parents were like, they put, they put rules in place. And they explain to you that you have rights. You have a right to drive. And there's all kinds of things you can do with this vehicle. But here's the thing. If you are not responsible, what happens? We're going to take those keys away from you. So your parents, they gave you a curfew right? They told you, you better not text and drive. They told you, you better not play the radio too loud. They told you, you know, don't you pile eight people into your little Pontiac, right? I mean, they gave you all of these rules. And if you didn't, if you weren't responsible with your rights, you lost your rights. And you can do that today. I mean, you know, you, you have a right to drive, but if you're not responsible with your rights, they'll take your license away. You know, I believe everybody has a right to be a parent. Everybody who has a child has a right to parent that child. But here's the thing. If you're not responsible with that child, what happens? We take your rights away because you're dangerous. Because here's the thing. If rights aren't coupled with responsibility, someone's going to get hurt, right? You're going to get hurt and you're probably going to end up hurting somebody else. Rights have to be coupled with responsibility. So here's an intelligent question. Why is there no bill of responsibility? Right? Why is there no bill of responsibility? If there's a bill of rights, it should be coupled with a bill of responsibility. And here is the reason why. It's because our founding fathers were Christians. And they, they assumed moral guardrails that everyone understood and that everyone would follow. They, they believed that our founding, our founding fathers, they were like, well, they came across on, on the Mayflower. They, they escaped persecution. They came to be Christians. And they said, well, there are certain things we assume. Certain things that we just believe are going to happen, right? Certain things that we think everybody is going to do. And there are several of those that we find in our Constitution. The first one is this. It is that there was a consensus of conscience, I mean, these people all came to, you know, for, for religious freedom, to be able to worship God. And there was a consensus of conscience. There were certain things that were white and black, that were right and wrong, that there were, there were not as many gray areas back then as there were today. It's wrong to lie somebody. This, you, could, you could used to be able to make a handshake deal. Does anybody re old enough to remember handshake deals? Where you could give a man or give a woman your word and your word was your bond, right? You used to be able to do that. Because there was a consensus of conscience that lying was wrong. Period. There was no gray. Hurting somebody, murdering somebody, 
It was wrong. Stealing from somebody. Lying. It, it was, there was a consensus of conscience that there are certain things that are white and black. They're wrong. And they believed that. And then there was this one. They also had divine accountability. They believed that their freedom that they had been given was from God. And so they honored God. They thanked God. They had gratitude to God because they had just escaped religious persecution. They came over and they were able to be free and they were given all these freedoms. For the first time, there was no king or queen or lordship that lorded over them. For the first time, they were in a place where, where things were governed by the people and, and, and d- decided by the people. And so they had a divine accountability to God. They were appreciative and they said, you know what? We wouldn't do anything to not honor God because we are so thankful. We would never disrespect this this gift, this blessing of freedom that we've been given. And and then there was another one. They also believed that individual expression governed by concern for other individuals. So what this means is, is because they believed that nobody would use their rights to take advantage of their neighbor. Because, I mean, back then, you got to think, if you did that, you needed your neighbor. I mean, during those harsh winters, during those time periods of of farming and working the land, I mean, you needed your neighbor. You needed your community. And so you would never, I mean, if you, if you did something wrong to your neighbor, if you did wrong by them and they, you know, kind of pushed you out and you were on your own, you probably weren't going to make it through the next problem. You probably weren't going to make it through the next season of sickness. You probably weren't going to make it through the next season of winter. You needed your neighbor. So they believed there's no way anybody would take their individual rights and express them in a way that would take away from somebody else's rights. They're always, always, always going to show concern for, for somebody else. We, we find this in the Declaration of Independence. If you read the Declaration of Independence, this is what it says. It says, we hold truths, some truths, to be self-evident. Meaning, everybody believes this, right? I mean, it's got to be self-evident. We're all on the same page. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator, by God, with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We hold these truths to be true. Self-evident. A consensus of conscience. That were given to us by who? By our creator, by God. We didn't create this. God gave us this. We, we, we should honor him. We owe him. There's a, a, a debt of gratitude that is there. And there are unalienable rights that we all have that nobody would use to hurt anybody, right? This is what is written in our Declaration of Independence. And John Adams, John Adams, he, he said this. He said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. You know what John Adams meant when he wrote that? John Adams was saying, this experiment will fail unless there is a a consensus of conscience, a divine accountability to God, and only if People use their rights in order to love their neighbor, in order to support their neighbor. But if at any time there is not a consensus of conscience, if at any time we forget our divine accountability to God, and if at any time that our rights begin to compete with other people's rights and we try to use our rights to take advantage of other people's rights, then this experiment will fail. And do you see any of that in our country today? See, John Adams said, this is, this is what America was built on. This is, this is, this is the, the formula. This is how we designed America to work. This is, this is the only way that our freedom can ever be held together. But if we don't have this, oh, this experiment will fail. And we see that. We see that all the time, right? Do you know why laws ha- have to be created? Laws have to be created when there's a disagreement about people's rights competing against each other. When somebody uses their rights to take advantage of somebody else's rights and somebody says, I have the right to do this. And somebody says, no, you don't. I have the right to say that you don't do that. I have the right to this. That, that's when a law has to be created. That's when, we ha- we, you know, we, when our rights compete with one another. Then the state has to step in. And by the way, you need to keep that in perspective because that's the only time the state should have to step in. 
So I know we have a lot of talk today about we need more laws and more rules. But what we're saying is, is I want you to tell me that my rights are right. And that's not the way America was built to, to work. It's only when my rights take away from your rights that the law should have to be created, that the state should have to step in. But here's the thing about that is, you know, sometimes I hear people say, you know, like, I I'm a good person. I'm a law-abiding citizen. But here's the thing about the law. The, the law represents the minimum requirement, right? I mean, when they made laws about, you know, the speed of highways, what they said is like, look, this guy thinks he can go as fast as he wants, and, and this guy thinks that it shouldn't be that, so we got to step in, and we got we to make a, a requirement. This is, this is what the speed should be on this road. But that's the bare minimum. Like, that's, that's, that's the line. Like, if you're not hitting that, you're, you're breaking the law. But th that doesn't mean you're a good person. That doesn't mean you're a good citizen, right? And, and, and here's the thing. We don't want that. Our country was never meant to be a country built on laws. That was what we were running away from. Running away from rules, running away from laws, running away from a state that ran things and told us how we were supposed to live. The thing is, is about individual rights is that if individual rights are regulated by law, it's a recipe for you and I to be selfish. Because you know what happens? People find ways around the law, right? People find a way to, to get around the system. Well, if that's the law and if that's the way it is and if all I need to do is find some sort of loophole, well, okay. Individual rights regulated by law is a recipe for you and I to be as selfish as we want. And we say to ourselves, well, as long as I'm not breaking the law, I'm in the right. But we all know that's not true. And here's what happens. When a country is regulated and built on laws, this is what you'll see. Ten time, nine times out of ten, every time this has happened in history, you see the rich rule the poor. Women are a commodity. Children are victims. If it's legal, it's moral. Law informs conscience, and everybody looks for a loophole. And again, is this kind of what we see today? And this is the result. Every time this happens in history... When we start yelling for the state to take care of our problems, when the, we yell at the state to come up with the rules, when we look at the state to tell us what we need to do, we break down the, 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 the system that our forefathers created for us, the way that they designed this to be. It's like we're taking it away and we're just, we're watering it down. We're creating something that was never meant to be created. So what do we do? Well, as, as Christians, as American Christians today, our moral choices, our choices, how we use our freedom today, our Christian character is more important than ever. Because our forefathers created this for a religious people. Doesn't mean it's ours, doesn't mean we, take, we, we have some sort of ownership about it. But what it means is that we were designed, it was created for us as Christians, for us to, to be the models of what this looks like. And this is what Paul talks about in his letter to Galatians. When he wrote the, this letter to Galatians, he wrote it to Gentiles. And the Gentiles were really having a hard time with, with leaving the Old Covenant, leaving the Old Testament. You know, the 613 Jewish laws that the Jews wanted to hang on to. He, he, Paul wrote them and he said, you don't have to follow those anymore. That's not what God designed for us. That's not how Jesus wants us to live. You know, laws, again, laws are not, a list of rules are not the intended purpose. It's not what we want to see happen. You have this freedom. But he talks about what to do with that freedom. So he writes him, and in Galatians, this is what it says. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Woohoo! But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Paul says, you've been given freedom as well. Those 613 laws, they have become obsolete. They serve their purpose. They got us to Jesus. And now Jesus has given us a new command to love God and love our neighbor. And it is best. It is better. This is the way it was intended to be. We are getting back to the garden. This is the way God wanted us to be, to choose the right thing, to choose the loving thing for my brother or sister, to choose what honors God. He says, but look, don't for a minute think that just because you're free and you don't have to listen to these laws and these rules anymore that you can just do whatever you want. He says, you need to use your freedom wisely. Do not indulge in the flesh. How many times in our culture today do we look at things and we go, well, I'm just going to do what I want. I'm going to live my best life. 
I'm going to spend my money how I want. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to say what I want. And you know what? If anybody has a problem with it, that's their problem. Let me tell you, that's not America. That's not what America was built on. And that's not what Christianity is built on either. Christianity is not about putting myself first. It's not about doing what I want to do. It's not about indulging in the flesh. It's not about doing what I want. If anybody has a problem with it, that's their problem. Christianity is about servanthood. Christianity is about being last in line. Christianity is about using my freedom not to get myself further, but to do what's right for you. It's about using my rights to protect your rights because your rights are just as important as my rights are. And so you know what? I have the freedom to say whatever it is I want. I can say whatever I want. I can post whatever I want. I can tweet whatever I want. But you know what? That doesn't make it right. Paul would say, don't tweet whatever you want. Don't use your freedom to say whatever you want. There's some things you shouldn't say. So you know what? Because I love God, I want to honor God. And because I love my neighbor, there's some things I'm not going to say. Some things that I'm not going to post. Some things I'm not going to send to people. Because that's what it means to be Christian. And you know what? That's what it means to be American. But today we live in this society where even our leaders say, just say whatever you want. Just do whatever you want. Just let it out. Just let it spew out. If anybody's got a problem with it, that's their problem. And we have a problem today where we can't even listen to one another today. Where if my rights are different than your rights or if my beliefs are different than your beliefs, I just want you to shut up. And that's not the way Christ intended us to live together. And that's not the way it's going to be when we're all together with God in the end. And then Paul, he, he goes on and he says this. He says, rather, what you should rather do is serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, rather than doing whatever it is you want to do, and if anybody else has a problem with it, well then forget them. Rather put one another first. Because the entire law, with the command that Jesus gave, it is fulfilled in loving your neighbor as yourself. It's about putting one another first. It's about servanthood. It's about doing what Jesus did. When Jesus got down and he washed the feet of his disciples, when Jesus got down on people's level, when he sent himself in human form to be with us, to suffer with us, that is what it's about. And that is what America was built on. Not using my rights to take advantage of other people. Not using my rights to offend other people. Not using my rights to put other people aside. Even though they may believe differently than me, look differently than me, or come from a different culture than me. That is not what America was built on. And Paul warns us of what it looks like when my rights compete with somebody else's rights and I don't care. He says, here's the, here's the warning. He says, if you... If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Again, could this be more relevant today? Because how much biting and devouring do we do of one another? I, you know, this last year, we've gone through a health crisis. We've gone through an election crisis. We've gone, th we've gone through a racial crisis. And how much biting and devouring have we done of one another? And what's sad is how much biting have Christians done? How many times have Christians done the devour devouring? How many times have Christians done the fighting? How many times have Christians, in order to stand up for ourselves, fought back and caused issue? Paul says, if that's what you do, if you bite and devour each other, you will end up destroying one another. And for us as a nation, as a country, if we do that to one another, we'll destroy our nation. We'll destroy the country. We'll, we'll, we'll end up submitting and giving away our freedom because we'll end up losing it. Because when we bite and devour one another, then the state steps in. And when the state steps in, the state has their agenda. And then we end up right back to what we ran away from. Being ruled by kings and queens and people who are richer than we are. And then Paul goes on and he says this. So I say, what he's saying is he said, I'll, I'll give you a different option. So I, I say what you ought to do is 
walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He says, here's the second option. Walk by the Spirit. As Christians, we should walk by the Spirit. We should not listen to our instincts. We should not listen to our, our emotions. We should not listen to our selfish desires. We should not li- listen to our initial response that we want to give. We should walk by the Spirit. And you know the fruits of the Spirit. Patience, love, not being jealous, not being envious, being, being servants, putting other people first, mercy, being humble. I mean, this is how we should walk every single day. And he says, if you do this, if you walk by the Spirit, if you make sure that you and God's wills are constantly aligned, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And you will not end up biting and devouring other people. doesn't mean other people won't bite you. Other people are probably going to still bite you. But you won't bite back and you won't end up destroying one another in war. So there are three things that I want to I want to recommend that we do. Things that I think that if Christians modeled this, if Christians lived this way, if Christians did this, I think we would not only represent the church well and see people come back to church, but we would also see our country change. And and this is the, these are the three things. Do what's responsible, not what's permissible. Here's the thing, just because it's permissible doesn't mean it's the wise thing to do. We have to choose to be responsible. We have to choose to be responsible with our bodies, with our sexuality, with our finances, with, with, our, with our health, with our jobs, with our mouths. I mean, we have to choose to be responsible. And just because it's permissible, and let's all agree, there's a lot of things that are permissible today. I mean, today you could pretty much say whatever you want and somebody's going to defend you. I mean, today you could spend your money how you want and people probably won't judge you. You could do all kinds of things with your sexuality today and people will tell you that's a okay. But just because it's permissible, just because it's the cultural norm, doesn't mean it's responsible. Doesn't mean that it's what's best for you. So we have to choose to do what's responsible, not what is permissible. And the second thing is this. Do what's moral. Not what's modeled. Do you know something I was thinking about when I was writing this and I was, I was working on this? You know one thing that we don't have today that, I mean, again, I don't want to like sound stupid or anything, but I felt like I had when I was growing up is there are just not any role models anymore. There aren't. I mean, who do your kids look up to? The role models that we have today. I mean, I just, I, you know, I don't want to sound old or anything, but it's just not, they don't feel like they're the role models I had today, okay? LeBron James is not Michael Jordan, okay? That's all I'm saying, all right? <laughs> Amen, all right? It's the only thing I'm going to say controversial today, all right? But I mean, seriously, we don't have any role models. Where have all the role models gone? Men, can I talk to you men specifically for a minute? What happened, what happened to the role models that men used to be? I mean, guys, come on, can we talk a minute? Can we, can we step up as men just a little bit? You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put out an open challenge right now, okay? Some of you are like, he's going to fight me in the parking lot, all right? <laughs> no, I already fought some neighbors who parked in the wrong spot this morning. I'm, I got all the fighting out of me, all right? No, you know what? You know, I look at like our children's department. We have some great guys in our children's department who teach every single week. Pastor Wes, Bo, I would love to have some more men in our children's department because you know what? Our children need some men too. Our women, you guys do a great job. Children's department, you teachers do a phenomenal job. I'd like to see some more men teach our kids in the children's department because we need to model that men. We need to model that to to our boys and girls. We need some more men to step up and serve, okay? I love that y'all changed light bulbs. That's all good, right? Thank you for helping me get all the water out of the basement yesterday. But can we all be honest? Rhonda did most of the work, okay? But, so we need some men to step up, right? Men, can we, can we show some self-control? Can we show our children what it looks like to have sexual purity? That when we say that we love their mom or we love who we're with, that we actually mean it. That we actually are pure. That we put our wives before ourselves. That we are here to serve them, not be served by them. Can we model that? Can we model that to the world? Because I look out there in the media, and I look out there in the culture, and I don't know where all the men have gone. They're all in skinny jeans running around more worried about other things than what, what it means to be a man. And I'm in skinny jeans. Shoot. But 
But we need to step up. We need to step up as men. Women, I can't talk to y'all. I'm not one of them. I don't even self-identify as one of you. So anyway, I'm not going to say anything to you. But we need to step up as men. And then we need to step up as Christians. We need as Christians. There's a lot. You know what? There's a lot that is permissible and a lot is modeled in the church world that is not right. That is not moral. We need to choose as Christians and as a church to do what's moral, not what's modeled. I had a meeting with somebody a couple weeks ago and they said, well, that's just how we've always done it. And I said, just because that's the way we've always done it doesn't mean it makes it right. There are a lot of things the church has done for a long time that we have accepted as norms that are not right. And that's the reason the people are leaving the church. Not because the culture is headed to, to, headed to hell. It's because we've done things that were not moral and were not right. And we should do better. I'm preaching too much. Anyway, here, here's the last thing. The last thing is this. Do what's honorable to God, not what's best for you. I've asked you this question before, and it's a great question. I think it's a I think it's an awesome, awesome question to ask anybody. I think if you ever came in and you said, Pastor, I need counseling, I need to talk to you. This is probably the question that I just need to write over, over my office. When's the last time you said no to yourself? When people come in with marriage problems, people come in with addiction problems, people come in and say, I'm having a hard time making friends, I'm having a hard time relating to people. Uh, I'm having a hard time with my finances. Probably the question that could get us on track of where we need to go from here is when's the last time you said no to yourself? Because the truth is, is that many of us don't. Because if it's permissible and it's legal and it's okay, and I feel like it, I usually do it. But that doesn't mean it's right and that doesn't mean it's what's honorable to God. Right? Do what's honorable to God, not what is best for you. You are not the center of the world. I know. You hate hearing that. And your mom keeps telling you you are. But, man, you're 35, bro. You're not the center of the world. You're not. You're not the center of the world. You've got to choose to do what's honorable to God. And you know what? What's honorable to God is usually you being last. Is usually you being a servant. Is usually you taking the place of Jesus and washing somebody else's feet. You know what John Adams said? This is what John Adams said. He said, you will never know how much it costs the present generation, his generation, to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make good use of it. Because if you do not, I shall repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. When our forefathers are in heaven and they see what we have done and how we have behaved, will they be proud? Will we make them proud? Or will they put their head down and, and shake their head and say, you should have never even tried? Because it's very clear that not too much long, longer later, they, they threw it all away. And they bit each other and they devoured each other and their rights competed with one another and everybody said that they were right and when everybody thinks they're right, who says who's right? And it ended up being a, a people that was made for the people and by the people. It became a place that was run by presidents and senators and, and courts. Is that what we want? No, of course not. So here's my challenge to you. This Independence Day, this July 4th, another point in time in our, in our country where we were stop. And I think many times when we stop, we, these things kind of just pass over our head, you know. And it's fun. There's nothing wrong with having fun. You know, there's fireworks and red, white, and blue and barbecues and camping and, and, and things to go do. That's, that's all fine and good. But we should also stop and take a look at what our forefathers meant for our country to be. The design of what this was supposed to look like. And to ask ourselves, am I helping or am I hurting this? Am I honoring God? 
am I, am, I, am I more than just a moral person? Am I not just a law-abiding citizen, but am I, am I a servant? Would I, would I not make my, 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 the founding fathers proud, but would, would God be proud of the decisions that I've made? And when's the last time that I told myself no? When's the last time that somebody said, hey, I think what you're doing may not be the wise thing to do, and we listened. Instead of saying, well, that's your opinion, and I don't care what you think. And if you have a problem with me, then forget you because I don't need you. No, you do need them because we all need one another. And we all need one another and we better get used to it because in heaven, we all want to be there together. <laughs> That's the point. The point is, is that as a Christian, I want you to make it as badly as I want to make it. The guy that cuts me off in traffic, I want her to make it. The person who gives me the middle finger in traffic, I want them to make it. The, the person who upsets me and offends me, I want them to make it. I want everybody to make it. We're in this together, not just as a country, but as a Christian nation as well, because we are all children of God. And Jesus Christ, like it or not, died for every single one of us. Every race, every creed, every culture, every, every state, every continent, Republican, Democrat, black, White, Hispanic, Asian, heterosexual, bisexual, pansexual, whatever it may be, Jesus still died for every single one of us because every single one of us have sinned. Every single one of us have not measured up at some point in our life. And so every single one of us are invited to pick up our cross and to follow him. So as a nation... And as Christians who claim to follow Jesus, we have to do better. Let me pray for you this morning. Father God, we come to you this morning. We are so thankful for the freedom that we've been given. And God, we, we, we take advantage of it so often. We forget the liberties that we have, liberties that you granted us. And God, we're so thankful for the mission and vision you gave our forefathers a long time ago. And God, I just pray that we would do the right thing, that we would not use our freedom to take advantage of one another, but that we would use our freedom to serve and to love one another. That we would do what is right. That we would follow your greatest command to love you and to love our neighbor. That God, that law is fulfilled through love. So would you help us to do that? Would you help us to make you proud? Would we practice what is already going to go down in heaven? Would we be together and would we care for one another? Would we love one another? Would we have a consensus of conscience? Would we have a divine ac accountability to you? And God, would we use our rights to protect the rights of others around us? Would you help us to put others first? God, if there's any selfish part of our heart, if there's any part of ourself that we're not willing to deny, would you help us to say no to ourselves today? Would you help us to say no to ourselves, and would you, would you help us to, to put others first? Would you help me to put my husband first? Would you help me to put my wife first? Would you help me to put my kids first? Would you help me to put my neighbor first? Would you help me to put my coworker first? Would you help me to, to put my boss first? Would you help me to put others in this church first? God, would we just be in a submission competition where we are constantly trying to outdo each other in love? Not in trying to get ahead, but trying to outdo one another in love. Because that, that God is American. And that God is what heaven is going to be like. So would you help us to practice it now, Lord. And in your name we pray. Amen.
gonna swap out the batteries real quick. This is the word here in the flesh, living among the meek and lowly, the voice of God, his every breath, salvation Christ, the soul of glory. 
worshiping with us today, even despite some technical difficulties. Hope you guys have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next Sunday.